today's message is a giant surprise. It's cultivating the culture of heaven, part two. <laughs> Last week, we began talking about cultivating the culture of heaven. And we discussed paradise lost and paradise restored through the gospel. Paradise is such a great word because it captures an imagination of the world as it was meant to be, doesn't it? And there are so many things in this world that people experience that they cry out, this is not meant to be this way, right? When you've been hurt by other human beings or you see injustice in this world or you see brokenness in people's lives, something cries out, this is not the way it was meant to be. And the gospel message is that the kingdom of God is at hand. You can experience it now. It's not just some future after you die, you get to experience it. The gospel of Jesus Christ is power to know God and to become like Christ and experience his kingdom. It's here. It's at hand's length. Believe. Repent and believe the good news. It's a present reality that people can experience. And when people experience it, Scripture uses language like it's, a, it's finding a treasure hidden in a field that when you find it, you sell all that you have to possess it. Or a pearl of great price that you find. It's that wonderful when you experience the kingdom. And there's something in the heart of God that I believe that there is a much greater manifestation of Christ's kingdom that he wants us to experience as his people. We were talking it all in because Trey was out of town. And, and we were looking first about the passage where uh, Peter was in prison and the church was offering constant prayers for Peter. And God sent his angel and brought Peter out of prison. And at first Peter thought it was just a dream because like, really? And then he realized, no, this wasn't a dream. And he went to the church and the church was like, oh my gosh, it's his ghost. Even though they had been praying for him, they couldn't believe that he was really at the door. And it was so strange in a sense because earlier in the book of Acts, God had delivered him from prison once before with his angel. When they were thrown in prison for preaching the gospel, the angel comes in, sets them free, says, go back to the temple and preach the gospel more. And they did it. So something happened over time that decreased expectation. Just the cares and concerns of this world, the troubles and trials that we face, often restricts our expectation, doesn't it? But I just love that they prayed the prayer of faith, obviously, because they thought it was his ghost. And God answered the prayer anyway, didn't he? Because prayer has that much power. But right before that, in the book, book of Acts, is a story that I absolutely love. Peter's walking around in his shadows healing the sick. You know, and if we were like Hindu holy men or Buddhist holy men, we'd say, wow, Peter's really holy. Maybe God had his shadow heal the sick so he could say, it's not my fault. I didn't do it. God did it. But it's really an expression that the presence of the kingdom is real. His shadow, the presence of God that was with the church, people came from all around, brought out their sick, and they were healed. And Peter didn't really do anything but walk around. But it tells, and these things are written for our edification. They capture our imagination. I mean, it should make you ask the question, what is truly possible through the gospel of Jesus Christ? What is truly possible? Because, you know, people say, what is your greatest fear? My fear is that we could live life and miss out on the glory of God. You know, it's not about guilt and condemnation and shame. It's about there's incredible possibilities to experience the Lord in true satisfaction in life. And we can fall short of it. God wants to show us his goodness. He wants to show us his grace. He wants us to experience him. You know, not so we can say, look at how cool we are, but just because he loves us, like any father loving his children. Isn't that awesome and neat and exciting? And, and we read these stories, and we need to keep reading these stories, and we keep discussing the same things over and over again because they're so foreign to our normal experience, aren't they? 
that we've got to keep feeding on them until they become our normal expectation, where we wouldn't think anything else should be expected, right? So two ideas that we're going to explore with considering paradise lost and paradise restored through the gospel is how do we exactly transform the world through the gospel? And two, what is a biblical expectation for how much we can expect the gospel to transform the world? And I think I read those too fast, so I'll I'll try to rephrase that question. How much of a total world transformation do you believe is possible through the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Because we all have kind of expectations, whether we talk about them or not, for our own life, for our community, for our nation, for the world, for world history. What do we believe the future holds? And a great question to go with that is, how much of an impact can the gospel make? Right? Before we get into scripture, with this idea in mind of transforming cultures. Transforming cultures. From what? Hell to heaven. From hell to heaven on earth today. Well, it's not hell on earth today. For a lot of people, it is. A lot of people literally live in a daily experience of hell on earth. Is there any hope for them? And a lot of people live in fear and worry and frustration and anger and bitterness and unforgiveness. They're in bondage. Is there hope for them? I really do believe that the reason we have so many false religions and idolatry in movements like communism and socialism or other religions like Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism especially the West love affair with Eastern religions today, is because we've made the gospel to be only relevant to the next life rather than he is a living Messiah able to set at liberty the captives today. I really think that if if the gospel of Jesus Christ, if Jesus isn't a Messiah that can do anything in this life, then the world is naturally going to look for a Messiah elsewhere. They're false messianic movements. They promise you heaven. They promise you satisfaction. They promise that you will find fulfillment. What is Buddhism? All life is suffering. Yeah, suffering stinks. I like to quit suffering. Great, let me tell you how. Follow this eightfold path. And essentially, you suffer because you hold the things that are impermanent. So long story short, in my mediocre summary, quit caring about things. Whereas the gospel says, love, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, that Jesus came and he has compassion. Be truly human. Love one another and love one another well and care deeply even if it ends up getting you hurt. And then if you get hurt, what do you do? Forgive and love again. And you get hurt again and what do you do? Forgive and love again. Well, doesn't that cause suffering? Yeah but I also find his presence in the midst of it. I find his grace in the midst of it. I find a joy and a peace that passes all understanding because I walk with Christ. I mean, it's beautiful, isn't it? That's wonderful. But I really, the story that I'm going to read comes from, um, well, let me get, get the quote so I can get it accurate. It comes from Understanding the Culture by Jeff Myers. And it's a story that I think really challenges us about how powerful the gospel is to change a culture. So Ernest Gordon's To End All Wars is a moving example of how Christians can shape culture even amid unimaginable circumstances. Gordon was a prisoner in one of the cruelest places on earth a squalid and terrifying World War II Japanese prison camp called Chunkai. Chunkai was filthy, disease-ridden, and inhumane. 
Prisoners frequently died from starvation, disease, overwork, beatings, shootings, beheadings, or hopelessness. One man, Dusty, was mockingly hung on a tree to die like the Savior he professed. Deprived of their humanity, the prisoners adopted a beastly survival of the fittest mindset. Death meant nothing, and life meant little more. Gordon, a member of the elite Scottish Highlanders, described it this way. Death called to us from every direction. It was in the air we breathed, the food we ate, the things we talked about. The rhythm of death obsessed us with its beat, a beat so regular, so pervasive, so inescapable that it made Chunkai a place of shadows in a dark valley. Sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? Is there hope that a person in that situation could experience a different culture? Is that a culture that, I mean, just to hear that people lived in that culture is heartbreaking, isn't it? And we think that the only way of liberation is we need some soldiers to go and liberate them. But what if there's a liberation that begins in the soul that can transform the darkest life, the darkest situation from darkness to light, from the power of the devil to the power of God? I believe that we want to see a a natural, complete liberation, and it's not complete until there's total liberation. But true freedom begins in the soul. True liberty, true culture change begins in your own heart and in your own attitude. Repent. See things differently. Think things differently. That's where it begins, a culture change. Now listen, but two events, according to Gordon, changed everything. First, word spread of a prisoner who, in the name of Christ, offered his own food and stayed by the side of his bunkmate to nurse him back from the brink of death. His his bunkmate survived, but he did not. In the second incident, a guard threatened to randomly execute the prisoners, serving a work detail until someone confessed to stealing a missing shovel. A Christian stepped forward and confessed, saving the lives of the others. The enraged guard beat the man, crushing his skull. The others watched in horror, helpless to assist the man who had given his life for theirs. A later recount showed no shovels missing. From a purely pragmatic viewpoint, these deaths were a foolish waste. But in the camp, they led to a new attitude of you first, rather than me first. Christian volunteers changed gangrenous bandages and bathed hideous wounds. Life regained some of its meaning. Even the experience of death changed as prisoners stopped piling bodies instead of electing chaplains to conduct honorable funerals for the fallen. Out of this restored humanity grew a stunning culture. The prisoners formed a library and taught courses in everything from math to philosophy to languages. They staged plays. Having retrieved six violins from a vandalized relief shipment, they formed an orchestra and held concert. The overall camp conditions hadn't changed. Frightful diseases still claimed lives. Food was still scarce and nauseating, but the culture had changed. Sacrifice had brought meaning out of misery. Gordon wrote, death was still with us, no doubt about that, but we were slowly being freed from its destructive grip. We were seeing for ourselves the sharp contrast before, between the forces that made for life and those that made for death. Selfishness, hatred, envy, jealousy, greed, self-indulgence, laziness, and pride were all anti-life. Love, heroism, self-sacrifice, sympathy, mercy, integrity, and creative faith, on the other hand, were the essence of life, turning mere existence into living in its truest sense. Here's a person in a death camp who is actually able to say that there, even though circumstances hadn't changed, I found what it meant to be alive in the truest sense. Culture had changed. These were the gifts of God to men. 
what Gordon described as culture. He and a handful of others refused to accept the environment that had been forced on them. Despite their horrifying conditions, they were able to shape something beautiful. Along the way, they transformed a place of hatred, cowardice, and greed into a place of love, heroism, and self-sacrifice. Does that story challenge anyone? I mean, it really makes you think, doesn't it? When we ask the question, how much of a culture shift can we expect the gospel of Jesus Christ to bring? It's hard to imagine any culture on earth that could be much worse than what I just read. You know, life circumstances being much worse. But there in the midst of those circumstances, this life of Christ starts to shine. And it starts to transform their experience of their situation in such a manner that Gordon could write, we found what it was to be alive in its truest sense. It begins in the heart, in an attitude of the heart, in tapping into the grace of God, and in, in seeing that love can overcome evil, that goodness and grace and light can overcome the darkness that there is no situation or circumstance that a person has to live in where the light and grace of God cannot break through. And it's beautiful. And it's hope bringing. And hopefully it even creates courage because it breaks the yoke of fear that holds so many people in bondage. It testifies if they could overcome in that culture and in that situation then what situation can't Christ break through in? It's challenging, isn't it? So I, I wanted to continue to talk about a biblical expectation concerning the transforming power of the gospel. And a lot of times I've been reading scriptures from the Old Testament because we often read them with this expectation that they're talking about the next life. But when we look closely, they're actually talking about the Messianic Age. And we have to ask, when did the Messianic Age begin? Well, what is the Messianic Age? It's the age where the Messiah is on his throne. Is Christ enthroned, or is that a future thing? It's a good question, right? Now listen carefully to Isaiah 60, 65, 17 through 25. And all of these, there's a QR code if you want to follow along on your phone. All of this is on the website, you know, because it's on the website, I guess. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. And you can, if you don't see the book of Revelation in this, well, then go read it again. But when, when did he create a new heavens and a new earth? The book of Hebrews says when he shed his precious blood, he cleansed the heavens and the earth. The Bible talks about us being a new creation, but it, the evidence becomes more convincing. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. Wait a minute. It's talking about people living and dying. That's not the next life, that's this life, isn't it? But the content is so challenging that it, it's almost unbelievable, isn't it? But what are the possibilities of divine grace? We just read about a prison camp being turned around. And earlier we talked about Peter's shadow healing the sick. It makes one wonder what is actually possible through the gospel of Jesus Christ, doesn't it? But I'll keep reading. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. So we're looking at a world that is being liberated from oppression. 
where people aren't being stolen from, where people's dignity is being kept intact. For as the days of the tree, so shall be the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. To actually enjoy the work of your hands. How beautiful is this? They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble. For they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. And dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain, says the Lord. At a cursory reading, it sounds like we're talking about after death, doesn't it? After Christ's return. But when you look closely at many of these passages in Scripture that prophesy and tell you what is the Messiah's kingdom going to look like, it has things in there that say, no, this has to happen in this life because people are still dying, and we know in that life, no, death will be no more. Death is the last enemy that will be defeated. But the passages are so challenging, they almost seem impossible, don't they? really what we're looking at is the book of Hebrews talks about this incredible cloud of witnesses. And what happened is God opened their eyes and they saw down through history. I see he's coming. He's coming. The king is coming. The Messiah is coming. That promise that God made to bring us back into the garden, I can see it. It's coming. And it said they died in the faith, not actually having experienced it. But then, when the fullness of time had come, Messiah came, born of a virgin, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. And on the third day, he rose again, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, where? On the throne of David. And he sent his Holy Spirit to execute his kingdom on the earth. All kinds of passages in the Old Testament, they start talking about the beauty and the wonder and the glory that people will experience under the rule of Messiah. And then they put words in there that you realize. It's not the next life, people. It's this life. And why we keep talking about these things over and over and over again is because they are hard to believe. And we have to keep wrestling with them until we believe and expect and faith lays hold and manifests what Christ wants to manifest. We've been talking about this river that flows from the throne of God and wherever it goes, that which is dead shall live, meaning they're still dead and things in the world. Oh, and it says that the trees that are planted beside this river, they'll bear fruit every month, and their leaves are for healing the nations, implying the nations still need healing. If we let the weight of this really touch us, what we are looking at is that God has hidden incredible treasures in these jars of clay. Incredible treasures, incredible possibilities. But it's like it's sleeping, it's slumbering, and it needs to be awoken again. There's got to be an awakening again. We read the Gospels and we see what Jesus did, but we say, but that was Jesus. But then we read the book of Acts and Jesus kept doing it through Jesus, his body. But somewhere, did we quit being his body? Did somewhere, did his presence end? Did somewhere his Holy Spirit get taken from the church? What has happened? Who has bewitched you, foolish Galatians? Are you trying to perfect in the flesh what was begun in the spirit? There's incredible possibilities God answers prayers, amazing prayers. He opens prison doors. Chains fall off. 
And people in a prison camp can find what it means to be fully alive even when their circumstances haven't changed. There really is a pearl of great price. There truly is water that if a person drinks, they will never thirst again. But if we are thirsting, if we are hungry, if we're dissatisfied, we're being robbed. There is also a thief and a robber that wants to rob us of this inheritance, to rob us of what is ours. To, though we are a great multitude liberated in Jesus Christ, seated in heavenly places, he wants us building pyramids in Egypt with a slave mentality to not know the truth, to not grasp the truth, to not enter in. In Hebrews, it says that we want to enter into this rest. And it's not talking about dying. It's talking about there's a place of true satisfaction in the Lord Jesus Christ that when a person drinks that living water, they will never thirst again. And then out of their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And it all begins with each and every one of us daring to believe and hope and expect and to ponder Messiah in his rule and reign. It's beautiful, isn't it? So in our class about biblical foundations for transformation, the last chapter I read, it talked about the plausibility structure of culture. If you've read chapter 3 yet, then you read that too. And it's, it's really interesting what he says because he talks about, from his perspective, culture has certain things that they don't even see as plausible to entertain the idea of. And in our culture, for many, it's not plausible to even believe God exists, let alone that he became a man, suffered and died and rose again, right? Right? And, and so it's talking about, how, well, I mean, I guess the implied question is how do we change the plausibility structure? But what about the plausibility of what is possible through the gospel of Jesus Christ? Maybe we have not dared to even expect what is there facing us in Scripture all the time. And that's why we keep looking at these things, reading these things, that something in our soul, something in our spirit that's crying out, wake up. Because I promise you, the Holy Spirit in you, the Spirit of Christ in you is crying, wake up, break out. There's a fullness of life. There's a bright shining sun. There will be no more darkness. We can live in his presence we can live in fellowship with him. We can live experiencing his grace and his love and loving one another. It's ours. It's ours. The plausibility structure. That's why we keep revisiting these ideas. It's to develop what that same book called strong belief these ideas that we're wrestling with, these scriptures, they are not normally accepted in the church today. And that's why we keep reading things like I'm about to read from Athanasius, because we are abnormal. We have somehow made it implausible to expect total cultural transformation. Yet this flies in this whole face of the idea of missionary movements, doesn't it? But Athanasius, who then is it that has done this? Or who is he that is united in peace, those who hated each other? If not the beloved son of the father, the common savior of all, Jesus Christ, who in his love submitted to all things for our salvation. For even from of old it had been prophesied concerning the peace ushered in by him. The scripture is saying they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into sickles and nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn to wage war. And such a thing is not unbelievable inasmuch as even now the barbarians who have an innate savagery of manners... 
while they still sacrifice to their idols. So I'll read it again because I turned the page. I'm sorry. The barbarians have an innate savagery of manners while they still sacrifice to their idols, rage against one another, and cannot bear to remain without a sword for a single hour. But when they hear of the teaching of Christ, they immediately turn to farming instead of war. And instead of arming their hands with swords, stretch them out in prayer. And in a word, instead of fighting amongst themselves, henceforth they arm themselves against the devil and demons, subduing them with sobriety and virtue of soul. This was the normal apostolic expectation for hundreds of years. It's also been the kind of expectation whenever this world has experienced true cultural transformation. It's because people actually believed that they would go into these barbarian lands with the gospel and convert them. And they would no longer be barbarians or heathens, idolaters. But it connects something very important. As they worshipped idols, as they worshipped other religions... They created hell on earth. As they turned and worshiped Jesus Christ, it created heaven on earth. Is that what we just read from Athanasius? A world where they're constantly fighting with swords and now they're farming and praying for one another? It's a total transformation, not just in the soul anymore, like in the prison camp, although we need to know that's possible. But here Athanasius is telling us in his whole book on the Incarnation, goes over it again and again. Wherever Christ is named, this is what happens. This is proof he's alive and not dead. Proof he's a living God because of what he does in human beings. And not just human beings, but nations and people groups and culture. And they had this total expectation that the gospel would have that transformative power. If it doesn't, it means our Christianity, our inheritance, our faith has been robbed. If we are not experiencing true apostolic Christianity, condemnation and feeling bad about it isn't going to get you there. Feeling like you're a failure isn't going to get you there. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Are you trying to make perfect in the flesh what was begun in the spirit? He who supplies the spirit and works miracles, how does he do it? By the works of the law or hearing of faith. There's something about revisiting and wrestling with these scriptures until we start to really wrestle with God in prayer. Lord, I see these things are true, but I don't believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I see these things are true. There it is, but it's so implausible to me in the face of the powers of this world, in the face of our culture, in these systems, in the face of the trajectory that I see this world going. It seems implausible to me with my life circumstances and situations. It seems implausible to me that I haven't screwed up my whole life forever. And that's when it would be unchristian to say, be it done according to your faith. But instead, dare to believe. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. There's an inheritance of faith that experiences real healing, real deliverance, real miracles, real culture change. If that prison camp could be a place where people said, I knew what it meant to be truly alive there, to overcome the spirit of death without circumstances change, then there's power in the gospel. But here with the apostles and with this apostolic movement that went down through history, we believed that we could change nations and cultures and people groups we believe that we could take cannibals and people that practice human sacrifice and make sons and daughters of God. And that's what he said happened throughout all history. That is normal Christianity. The power to change everything is in Christ. 
That's normal. That's our inheritance. And we are in a battle over our inheritance, church. Not just us. The church of Jesus Christ in this hour is in a battle over faith and expectation. We need to tap again into those streams of living water. We need to tap in once again to power from on high. We need to tap in and read these stories and read our histories and do our studies. Study and see if these things are true. Research them. If these things are true, then you'll find it in history. If these things are true, you can do your research. It can't be hidden. That's why the Gospels were like, he's been seen by 500. Do, look into these things. They are true. And, when I, and we're not just talking about the Gospels. We're not just talking about the Acts of the Apostles. We're talking about the impact of the Gospel that really birthed Western civilization. These things are true. Look into them. You might have to do some work. You might have to do some study. You might have to find the book hidden in the temple, dust it off because it's been hidden, but it's there. And you'll start to discover beauty. You'll start to discover hope. You'll start to discover who we really are as believers. I mean, I get it. It's hard. These jars of clay, mm -hmm. but God, I know how much I fail. Lord, I know how dumb I can be. Mm -hmm. That's why my, one of my favorite stories, I talk about it again and again, and it never gets old to me. Reading through um, the Old Testament and reading about Israel in the wilderness, and they were so stupid. That was my first thought the first time I read the Bible. How could they be so dumb? They, they had all these plagues in Egypt, and then he parted the Red Sea, and, and he fed them bread from heaven and water from a rock, and, you know, he gave them a cloud by day and a pillar by night, and they kept complaining and kept doing stupidly because what happens is that the Scriptures, for some reason, decided to hone in really close. And when you honed in really close, you could see all their faults. But then Balaam, really Balaam, on a mountain, looks down and sees that same encampment that we've been looking at up close. And he says, I see him. They're not numbered with any of the nations. The shout of his king is in their midst. I see him. They saw beside coming. He said, oh, let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. Well, what made him different? The presence of God. Peter, your shadow, what happened? I don't know, man, it's my shadow. No, it's the presence of God. It's with the church because of the atonement, because of the new birth, because we are a new creation. The incredible, it's like when I say the church needs to come awake, I can't express this enough. We receive the seed of Christ, but it's a seed. But with water and light, it grows. There's an incredible potential in every believer for total life transformation. But it needs water and light. So how, oh, how the gospel transforms culture. Oh, well, I might as well read my notes. I might have them here for a reason. Until we develop a strong belief in the transforming power of the gospel, we will never storm the gates of hell and turn the world upside down. Right? But how the gospel transforms culture. I'll read these fast. Matthew 13, 31 through 32, another parable he put forth, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed, and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Guys, why did you read that? Never despise small things. <laughs> this little tiny seed looks like nothing. Wait, with water and light and good soil, what it will become. But it doesn't become that overnight. And I will say we are facing 
a cultural war in this nation that will not be solved in one generation. But we can sow the seeds and know that it's going down. Jesus sowed the seeds in his apostles, and he could see the beast going down. Behold, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Why? Because I've, in, I've put the seed in these jars of clay. I'm raising up sons and daughters of God. Another parable he spoke, Matthew 13, 33. Another parable he spoke, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until it was all leavened. Guys, the kingdom comes by leavening. You don't really see leavening happening, but then the dough rises, right? The kingdom of God, we leaven. You know, like I, I was listening to Bob Mumford. He said it well. The kingdom grows through salt, light, and leaven. We keep looking for, through for imperialism, but it's salt, light, and leaven. Building one another up sowing seeds that will grow. We keep looking at imagery of things that take time. Don't they? Because it's the time to raise up sons and daughters of God. Although the word of God also says it'll pour out the early and latter rain in one day. As we see him, we become like him in the greater revelation of Jesus, instant transformation. But I do want people to understand so that there's patience and there's endurance Another parable, 13, 24 through 25. Another parable he put forward to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. This one I like the most because it tells you, God sowed good seed in the field to grow a beautiful garden. But somebody came and sowed weeds in, or weeds the weeds without the wheat would create hell on earth. The wheat without the weeds would create heaven and earth. And he said, the wheat is the sons of the kingdom. It's us. The trees planted by that river of life. Though when we're immature, we look just like weeds, and then the whole world looks weedy. And the immature church looks weedy. I get that. It's okay. But it has the potential to grow the garden of God. But I like this parable because it tells us you are that seed he has sown into this world. If you will grow up, the world will become different. It's beautiful, isn't it? He said, the wheat are the sons of the kingdom. We are seeds sown to transform the world. And so slogans are helpful because they make ideas simple, don't they? Transform the church, transform the world. Transform lives, transform the church. Raise up sons and daughters of God. Make disciples. Become like Christ. How we are transformed. In the class, we're talking a lot about this. Moreland loved this, loves this scripture. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I like putting this scripture first. There's something about knowing God's word and knowing the truth that is an important element in personal transformation. And we're, we're getting it. Last week, I really was in the book of Romans, and we're going to get back to it because it's the link. It's the transformational link. But it begins with, if you're reading the book of Romans, it said, hey, man, I was alive once, then the law came, sin revived, and I died. Well, that's a weird way of saying something, and yes, it is a weird way of saying something. But what it is, is I was going on my merry way thinking I was God's gift to the universe, that I'm a good, loving, decent person, but then God's law came, and I realized, oh, man, I'm not loving at all. <laughs> if this defines what love is, I'm way over here. The law came. All the law did was made clear and explicit the very law that is stamped on creation itself that blind men cannot see because they've hardened their hearts through sin by worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. 
but it's stamped on, it's not something that God gave arbitrarily. It's the very law that stamped on creation that men forgot. God gave his law. We read the law and we go, oh, wow, I'm really not loving at all. But we're meant to agree with the law, not just feel condemned, but forget the condemnation. Don't talk about that now. The law tells you this is how you love well. It include, it's not the New Testament morality. It's if you see your enemy and his ox has fallen down, you have to help him up. You shall love the foreigner and stranger in your midst. You will not have one law for you and one law for them. You, you were once foreigners and strangers, so you will treat them well. You will care. You'll be kind. You'll be merciful. You'll be tenderhearted. You will build one another rather than tear down one another. I mean, that's all of the law and the prophets are summarized by this. Love. Love God and love your neighbor. And this is how you love. And then you start to imagine what would be a world governed by love. And the more you feed on God's word, you see it, you see it, you see it. And you say, yes, that's good. That's beautiful. Why are kids living an old age and people are enjoying the fruit of their labor? Nobody's stealing from them and murdering them. Well, that's a nice world. Yes, it is. Nobody's for taking bribes to get justice. Great world. And, and you just start feeding on this world through scripture, you start to see it and you say, wow, yes, that's what I want. But then you start to realize, but if I covet, if I have anger in my heart, if I have bitterness, unforgiveness, selfishness, pride, arrogance, I'm the problem. But I started to agree with the law that it's good and I want to be this way, but I don't find the power to be this way. So the first part is be transformed by renewing your mind. Get to know the word of God. I like to use slogans. I want to see King Jesus, his character and nature. And I want to see what the world is like governed by him. And that's what scripture, Old and New Testament describes at every level. What the world looks like governed by love, governed by Jesus, who he is, what he's like. It's beautiful, isn't it? And then we should hunger and thirst for righteousness, hunger and thirst for the kingdom, hunger and thirst for that, and ask, is it possible? And that's where the Romans 8, 2 through 6 that we talked about last week. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death was I started to agree with the law that it was good. It, it describes heaven. It describes love. It describes justice. It describes something beautiful. I agree with it's good, but I, the good that I want to do, I don't do. This is the law of sin and death in me. It says now, Romans 8, 2 through 6, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That the, this is a hard word, the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. If I was to summarize it one way, the good I wanted to do, I couldn't do. Who will deliver me from this? Is there any hope for me that I can become loving? Is there any hope that I can become free? Yeah, but you can't do it. The law can't do it. Human will can't do it. Not by the will of men, but by the Spirit of God. His grace, his mercy, shed abroad into our hearts. That's why we celebrate communion every week. Because we have to know it's him. It's this life that he's sown in us growing. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We have to know that if we become more loving, it's not credit to anybody but our Savior and sanctifier. If we become more gracious and more merciful, and if we find true satisfaction in life, and if we can forgive well, if we can cover each other's faults well, What's happened? We can't take any credit. If you were just be a super Christian like me, no, that's a Pharisee. If you were just holy like me, that's a Pharisee. It's him. He's our savior. He's our redeemer. He's our deliverer. And when we change, we say, God, look what your grace has done. It is marvelous in our sight. 
Lord, we're so thankful and appreciative of what you're doing. When we start to find ourselves able to forgive when we've been hurt badly, we say, God, thank you. When we have been hurt badly and we start to heal, we say, thank you. When we find mercy and grace and compassion, we say, thank you, God, for you have done this. You, you are the potter, we are the clay, and all we can do is worship you and glorify you and magnify you. But your grace is real, and it changes us from the inside out. It can take those prisoners of war and let them find heaven on earth in the darkest place. It can take those barbarians and change them, but it all begins in our heart. But he goes, for those who live according to this, is where I was going, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. We were talking with our friend out there, and she was saying, there's a you know, you, you can look at life, and she said, it can look, every day can seem like the same, and it can seem like there's no hope, that there's no hope to break out. But there's another spirit in me that says, get up and keep going. Put one foot in front of another. Walk out. That's grace. And when you mind that voice, it leads to life and peace. But when you mind the other voice, there's no hope. It brings death. That, that's it. There's a spirit that he's placed in us that when we learn to mind it and set our mind on it and listen to it, it brings us into a world of life and peace. But when we mind, they're killing us, everyone. There's no hope. There's disease. It's darkness. It's misery. It's death. And the transformation that we read in that prison camp came because they started to mind the spirit rather than the flesh. And it's, you think, well, what does it mean? We can turn it into such a legalistic thing, but it's, you know, I, I remember it was Dwayne probably, but it might have been, well, I can't even think, too many, hanging out with too many people during the week. But it, we were I was telling some of these stories, and he said, you know, and he said, it's something. God is something. What do you mean? Something told me, keep going. Something told me don't give up. Something told me don't lose hope. God is often that something. It's that spirit that is in us, that he has placed in us, and it's real. And if we look for it and we listen for it and we want to hear it, we will hear it. And it will say, don't give up hope because there is hope. And that hope doesn't disappoint because Christ has died. There's something in us that will walk us out of every bondage. There's something that will walk us out of every prison. It's Jesus. He's in us. It's his spirit. Mind his spirit. Don't listen to the flesh. There's no hope. You ruined your life. God can use others, but not you. And there's no hope for the future. There's no hope for this nation. But is that the mind in the spirit or mind in the flesh? These things are impossible. The walls of Jericho are too tall. Goliath is too big. Jesus, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Why? Because I sent out these punks, these jars of clay. Giants will fall. Why? I'm sowing seed, and I'm watering seed, and I'm shining light on seed. Mind the spirit and not the flesh. Giants will fall. Cultivating the kingdom of heaven, culture of heaven. We develop a biblical worldview. And, and that's why we come in every week and read scripture and we have the preaching of the word and why we read books and read many different books and different types of books, history books. You want to find out some of the things I told you are true? You're going to have to read history books. And there, it's such a comprehensive and scope thing to do to develop a biblical worldview. But those slogans really do help. We want to see the king because we become what we behold. We want to see the kingdom so that we can have expectant faith and birth something in the world. It's, my, it's studying scripture. It's minding the spirit and not the flesh. It's receiving the Holy Spirit because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets us free from the law of sin and death as we just read. It's learning how to cultivate the Holy Spirit in your life. Thinks, you can't mind the flesh when you're genuinely thanking God from your heart. 
in appreciating him. The evil spirit in the flesh cannot survive in a culture of thanksgiving. The devil literally dies <laughs> in the presence of the light. He can't, the darkness can't survive in the light. It's impossible for you to feel wretched when you're genuinely thanking the Lord and appreciating him. Thanksgiving is so powerful, taking time to remember the blessings of the Lord. If those guys in that prison camp could actually write something like we found what was to be truly alive in this dark place. There's not a human being that if you don't look back in your life, you can't genuinely thank him and then start looking at your present life. There are things that if you will let your heart open up to, you will find that you are thanking him from the depth of your being, not a ritualistic thing, but the things of darkness cannot live in, a, in, a, in an atmosphere of thanksgiving. Know that our inheritance is righteousness, peace, and joy. So literally, rejoice always is a commandment, a horrible, wretched, awful commandment. But darkness cannot live in a, in a culture of rejoicing, in giving thanks, in forgiveness, in love. Prayer, worship, and adoration are important when they're an encounter with God that is stirring up the things that I just mentioned, or they can be dead rituals. The goal is embracing life and experiencing life, experiencing light. But I just want to close with the seeds that cultivate the culture of heaven on earth are those of us who are becoming like Jesus. He, we are what he sows into the world. We are the garden he plants in the world when it is not about getting us to heaven, but about reproducing the life of Christ in us. We cultivate the culture of heaven by raising up sons and daughters of God. Amen. Pastor Allen gets to close us today.